Okay, so um, this uh, figure comes from your reading by Ken Sheldon. And um, Ken Sheldon has this whole theory, which actually he's developed over about 20 or 30 years, that you guys have like your lane. When Brian says like, I've done really well being who I am, um, a curious person, somebody who really likes to connect with other people, um, someone who's probably spiritual but not religious, that would be what um, uh, Ken Sheldon will call your implicit personality, right? So when I had you do the values affirmation, when you wrote the this I believe, when you um, you know thought a little bit about your your personal interests, like that is what what Ken Sheldon means as like the real you. And then there's this kind of like explicit personality, the parts of you that you wouldn't fully own. They're not totally part of your identity, but like, oh, my mom wants me to be a doctor or like, I see, you know, people say that I should be, you know, more, you know, this or that. Um, and the goal here, I think, um, or the, the, the sort of um, recommendation is that self-concordance, right? Doing things with your life that are concordant or in alignment or aerodynamic with who your inner true self is, um, is what leads to happiness and success. Um, so um, you could have a non-concordant goal, something which is the opposite, but what, what most commonly happens if, you, have, if you, you, you pursue a career or you do a major or an extracurricular that's like partially concordant, right? So um, to say more about this, I'm gonna turn the mic over for actually a fair amount of class to um, Ben, who is much more um, expert in self-determination theory than I am. So Ben, um, welcome to Teaching Grit Lab. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here uh, with you. And uh, so let's start by just saying what I think, going back to the interest class, like what makes Ken Sheldon's idea interesting. And I think that is that most re goal research really looks at uh, not necessarily the what of the goal, of what the goal is. It just says like, if you're advancing towards your goal, if you're uh, making progress or achieving your goals, you'll have positive emotion, right? And if you're not advancing or you're uh, moving too slow, you'll have negative emotion. So in a sense, like this body of research sort of makes the question about what is, what is the right goal to have? It's sort of a non-question, right? And Ken Sheldon, uh, his, the, the, what makes his idea interesting is that he asks exactly that, right? Like, what are the kinds of goals that we should be, that we should be pursuing? What should we want? Um, and, and that's what makes the difference between the concordant and the non-concordant goals, right? So Ken Sheldon would say that we must choose goals that are self-concordant. That is, goals that are concordant to our implicit personality, that is, our, our deep desires, interests, and values. Uh, and not necessarily with uh, the explicit personality that it's uh, more superficial, right? That is like, what does your parents want? What, uh, what do your parents want for you? Or uh, what does society pressure you towards, right? So uh, a second important thing is that while explicit personality is easily accessible to consciousness, Implicit personality being this like deep self of my deepest values, needs, and desires, that's not so easily accessible to consciousness, right? So, so that leaves like a very interesting conundrum, which is like, how can I then use my implicit personality to choose my goals if that is not easily accessible, right? So that's like a, an interesting conundrum uh, that this theory has for us. And we'll see in a few slides from now, what is Ken Sheldon's uh, sort of recommendation to see how we can uh, figure that out. Uh, so I'll leave you with the mystery uh, in, for, for the next slide. Can I go to the next slide? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, let's see, did I get that right? Yes, okay, so it's a poll yeah. everywhere, right? All right. Yeah. So for this next slide, we'll, we'll sort of go through the procedure that Ken Sheldon would have his research participants do to evaluate the self-concordance of their goals. So we would like to ask you, what is a goal you have for the next six months? So what's a goal uh, that you have set for yourself? So we have starting my own business, grad school exam preparation, growing my business, get a job, writing, pass the IFM exam, apply to grad school. I see 
I'm not alone in that <laughs> quest for the grad school life. Do research, getting hired, making the most of the last semester of college, get a job. So we see some commonalities, commonalities there. Teach GridLab 3.0, I like that. I like that, get a job. Learn how to cook, that's fun. I love cooking. Position myself to learn from the best and finish my screenplay, awesome. I'd like, I'm getting really curious now, getting in peak physical condition. I'd love to talk to you about some of these goals. But so these are some of the goals you have, right? So let's uh, see what Ken Sheldon would have you do to try and see if these goals are self-important or not. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll ask you, why are you setting these goals, right? So like whatever goal you wrote, uh, please say, how much do you agree? Are you doing this because somebody else wants you to or the situation compels you to do that? So we have started with a pretty even spread. I think we now have more disagreement with this. So that's interesting. That's like, I have this goal because uh, somebody else wants me to. Should I go to the next one? Yeah, let's go to the next one. So for the next one, we have, are you doing this goal because you would feel ashamed, guilty, or anxious if you didn't? So we have pretty even spread, a lot of moderate agreement to this one. I think we've stabilized, so we can move on to the next one. You strive for this goal because of the enjoyment or stimulation that the goal provides you. So that's a lot of agreement. It's a good sign. You'll see why in a second. And the next one, you pursue this goal because you really believe it's an important goal to have. So that's also skewed towards agreement. So uh, while the, the last of the responses to this question come in, um, these four questions that we ask you right now are questions that Ken Sheldon would use to assess self-concordance. And the whole point or the whole assumption behind this is that uh, whereas the implicit self, the deep self, it's not easily accessible, if we think about how we feel about these goals, we can get a sense of uh, these goals being self-concordant or not. So like the main idea here is that self-concordance feels self-determined as opposed to feel as opposed to feeling uh, say ambivalent or reluctant, right? So if, if these goals weren't self-concordant, if these goals were in a way opposed to your deep self, you would feel some certain level of ambivalence. You would feel like, hmm, I'm not really sure about this. Uh, so this is, this is really interesting, right? Because you don't need to like have access, conscious access to your deep self to evaluate the self-concordance of certain goals. Uh, so this is like the procedure that, uh, that Ken Sheldon would use to assess your, the self-concordance of your goals. And we'll see a little bit more of detail about these like four reasons for doing goals because it's interesting, because it's important, because it's uh, shameful to not do it or because it's I want to get the rewards. Uh, we'll see a little bit more about this in a second, but the more autonomous the reasons for your goals are, the more likely these goals are self-concordant and uh, aligned to your deep self. So let's go to the next slide. Oops, I went too fast. Hold on. Oh. One. Wait, isn't there a graph? 
Did I like skip over the graph? Where did the graph go? Maybe. Wasn't there wasn't there data? Yeah, there is data. I don't know what happened. It's like 42, 41. Oh, it like I think it's after. Okay, maybe it's after. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So, uh, so as as we've been saying, right? Uh, self-concordance feels self-determined. Uh, and so examining the motivation we have for a goal is a good way to try to understand is this goal self-concordant or not. And here we have the tools of self-determination theory or SDT for short, that's how like everybody calls it, to try to evaluate the motivation behind our goals. So uh, you're likely familiar to the distinction between like intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation being doing things because you like to, that would be like the, I think was the last question or the second to last question about it being interesting and uh, fun or something like that versus extrinsic, meaning you're doing it to get something out of it. Oh, you wanna get paid or you wanna get a reward. Um, but self-determination theory, it's like its main contribution is taking sort of a deeper look into extrinsic motivation and seeing it's not just a th single thing, right? Like we can decompose it into several different kinds of extrinsic motivation. Uh, and these have different levels of uh, autonomy, right? So, so they get more adaptive the closer you get to intrinsic motivation. So let's uh, advance the animation, right? So here we have like the four different kinds of extrinsic motivation that SDT uh, posits. And as we move from external to integration, uh, these motivations become more internalized. So even though they're all extrinsic, they're not doing something just for the pleasure of the, or the sake of doing it, the more you go to, towards the right, the more you're gonna feel like you're choosing, uh, autonomously choosing, that you're in the driver's seat of your life, uh, choosing to do these things. And the more you are towards the left, towards the external side of the extrinsic motivation, the more you're gonna feel controlled, like somebody else is forcing you to, or like the situation is forcing you to, where you don't feel like you are driving the car, but you're being pushed into a certain direction, like you're being dragged by the current. And like one of self-determination theory's main points is that the more you feel that you're in control of your life, that you are the one driving, that you're the one making the decisions, that you're the one deciding, the better off you'll be, right? So, um, and, and this is like the main idea of self-determination theory being like, it's not only the quantity of the motivation that matters, but also the quality. So by quality, they mean having motivation that's more autonomous, that's more uh, feeling that you want to do it rather than you have to do it. So let's see what, what these sorts of uh, motivations mean, right? So as we said, intrinsic, it's doing it because it's interesting, it's enjoyable, I ju it's just fun, right? So like, I like to play the piano and like, I just think it's fun to do it. Uh, so I, I know Angela also played the piano, but I think it wasn't fun for her. No, so. not fun. <laughs> That was extrinsically motivated by my Chinese parents. <laughs> so uh, we can see the, the next slide. And that's opposed to a, a motivation, which is like, I'm not motivated. I don't want to do it. I, there's, I just doesn't, don't feel like it's possible or valuable. It's just not relevant, right? So, um, and then we have external regulation, which would be like doing it for a reward or to avoid a punishment. So like maybe Angela's parents told her, like if you play the piano and you behave with your teacher, then we'll get you ice cream or something. So like you wanna get a reward, right? A lot of people, for example, would say, yeah, like I do my job because I wanna get paid. Like I'm doing it for the money. I just wanna get or paid. When, when students say like, oh, is this on the final exam? Because they just want to get an A in the class. Not yeah. that anybody on this call, including me has ever done that. <laughs> um, so, so these like external, is, is very controlled motivation, right? Whereas the next one, then that becomes a little bit more internalized, just a little bit more. And then you're doing something just to protect your ego or just to feel like you are, uh, you know, like to get approval from yourself or approval from others or on the other side to avoid feelings of guilt or shame, right? So like maybe Angela played the piano because she wanted to make her father proud or something. So that would be interjection, right? A lot of people have maybe want to choose a career, not because they really enjoy it or because they think it's like important, but rather because they feel that like it will get them social approval 
right? Like it's society looks up on doctors and lawyers and not so much, at least here in Peru on psychologists, uh, which is like a sad thing, but, uh, but that's interjection, right? So as we move a little bit more towards the autonomous side, then we get identification and, th and that's doing something because I feel it's important. So like maybe you have a class you don't particularly like, but you know it's a means to an end, like it's important for your major, right? So you have to take that class for your major. Maybe it's not enjoyable, but it's important for your major. So you, so you're, you stop saying like, yeah, I have to do it, but it becomes more like, yeah, like I wanna do it. I, I, it's like means to an end, like it's, uh, it serves a higher goal, right? So that's identification. And finally, when it's like integrated with your values, when it's part of who you are, part of like, this is like my identity, then that's integration, right? So the four questions you were asked right now, uh, evaluated like, what's your goal intrinsic, identified, interjected and or external, right? So when, when they asked you like, you're doing this goal uh, to avoid feelings of guilt or shame, that's interjection. Do you think it's an important goal to have? That's identification. Do you think it's fun or stimulating? That's intrinsic, right? So um, in, from identification towards the right, you see that the locus of causality, they're all internal, right? So they are, they are all uh, autonomous motivation. And the two on the left, external and interjected, are external, right? So that's controlled motivation. Uh, so going back again to self-concordant goals, if your motivation for your goals is more autonomous rather than controlled, then Ken Sheldon would say that is a self-concordant goal. So how, how does that relate to grit, right? So here we have data that Paolo and Chase collected, and this is the correlation between grit and self-concordance. And we see a correlation, a significant correlation of 0.40. So here I'm interested in like hearing, why do you think this is? And if anyone, if anybody wants to like raise their blue some hand and provide like a tentative explanation, I'd love to hear that because like, I'm interested in this research and it would be really helpful. Avni, why do you think grit and self-concordant goals are related? I was gonna say just intuitively since perseverance is a big part of grit. And if you're like intrinsic or internally motivated I feel like you would be slightly more perseverant like in if you face a hardship or you're like lacking like you forget kind of like what was driving you to do something, you may be more resilient before giving up than if you're extrinsically motivated, if that makes sense. That's interesting. Does, does anybody else want to share uh, another possible explanation? Hunter. Yeah, I would just add that the other part is passion. And so if you already have the perseverant piece, but you're self-motivated, you're more likely to stick with your passion over time. So like that would make sense also kind of to me. I love that, like uh, making it more uh, sustainable, right, in the long run. Uh, Grace, what do you think? Hi, Ben. Um, I was thinking maybe it has something to do with sort of um, prolonged sense of, of reward if you're actually enjoying it versus like holding out for a reward that you think you're going to get eventually, even if you're not enjoying it in the short term. Hmm. That is great. Yeah, I agree with that. Like a lot of the more autonomous motivation is like more uh, like it lasts more through time. Right. Uh, and I'm going to like give my thought about it, which is somewhat related to this class, which is like uh, the idea of goal hierarchies. Right. Like uh, if you have a higher level goal that's aligned to your interests and your values, that's like a gritty high level goal. It's likely that that goal is also self-concordant because that's like your deep self, right? That's like your deep held interests and values. And like, then it makes more sense for you to be more perseverant towards lower level goals that serve that higher level goal. So I think that's like also maybe a part of it, but, uh, but um, let me just end this like correlation graph by saying that like, we really don't know uh, a lot about this. There isn't much research about grid and self-concordant goals. Uh, but we're working on it, so stay tuned. So let's see the next slide. So yeah, so uh, what we did with the poll everywhere, that's like the standard way in which Ken Sheldon and like this self-important re research is done. 
which is like you set a goal and then we ask you about your uh, self-concordance for that goal, right? So um, I wanna share this like recent study that looks at this idea of what if we did it before, right? So, and this brings us back to this idea of the Rubin cotton model. Uh, and, and so like the question is, when in the Rubicon model should we uh, assess or we should we look at goal concordance? So let's look at the results from this experimental study. So here's what they did, right? We have a group of people, some of them go in the experimental group and some of them go in the control group. They all will see this uh, list of six possible future selves. They, they are told something like, here are different ways in which you could be when you're 40. You could be wealthy and rich, or you could be wise or mature. And they see a list of six characteristics of possible future selves by age 40. Uh, before they are asked to select uh, one to work on, the experimental group is asked, how do you think it would feel toward, towards, these, uh, towards these possible selves? So like the experimental group, before deciding on one of the six, uh, report their self-concordance. Then they select their goal uh, and the control group does that afterwards, right? So like they're both, both the experimental and the control group are evaluating their motivation for this goal and thus looking at the self-concordance of that goal. But the experimental group does it before crossing the Rubicon, whereas the control group does it after. So does that matter or not? And here we'll see the results of that uh, research. So on the x-axis, we have the control and the experimental group. And on the y-axis, we have the number of extrinsic goals chosen out of, a, out of a possible of two. So in the control group, people chose around 0.6 on average, and that goes down to 0.4. And that's a significant reduction of around half a standard deviation. So before you set your goals, uh, you should evaluate, like before committing to a goal, that's the optimal point to assess the self-concordance of that goal. And why should we care about self-concordance? Like tying it all back up to the beginning is that if we're following goals that are self-concordant rather than non-self-concordant, we're more likely to work harder and to achieve these goals. And also like this uh, idea about um, goal achievement leading to positive emotion or happiness that is moderated by, by self-concordance. So what that means is that like, if you're working really hard towards a goal that it's not good for you, even if you achieve that goal, you won't feel well, you won't get happiness, you won't get well-being. Whereas the other side of the equation, that's like the, the good thing. Like if you're uh, working towards a goal and that goal is self-concordant, then it will bring positive emotion. So that just speaks to like the importance of evaluating our goals and like, how can we choose what goals to pursue? That's like a really hard question. And especially for like us young people. Yeah, I just included myself in the young people group, uh, but it's really important. And evaluating self-concordance before choosing goals uh, might be a good strategy. So Rachel has her hand up. Yeah, I just had a quick question on this. Um, so if there's like a goal that you have and you are electing into that goal because of an internal motivation, but there also is like a lot of external motivation, perhaps for other people also in that goal. How do you kind of like reconcile the two? Because like, obviously like your initial reason for like, for example, maybe if someone like chose to go to, to Wharton because they were going to like learn a lot or something, but there's like an external motivation of like their, um, is like a lot of like good exit opportunities or like it's the number one business school or whatever but that's not like what motivated you how do you make sure that you like stay on track with like your internal motivation and not like sort of like get off track and like see the people around you who are motivated by the same choice but for a different reason yeah that's a really interesting and i think a really important question uh, so like what really matters is like what is your reason right so like a lot of people for example uh, say, well, like you get paid, right? And like, that's also part of the motivation, but what's like the main reason why you're doing something, right? And uh, like the main reason for you, that's more important than like, uh, what are some other minor, not important reasons? 
Um, but the question of how to avoid that, like contaminating your initial motivation, that's really hard. Um, and you might be interested in looking at uh, like Ryan and DC's original study on the hidden cost of reward. Uh, of course, we don't have like a lot of time to go into that now, uh, but that might be something interesting to Google. <laughs> and maybe something interesting as a staircase thought. Thank you very much, Professor. That was very well done. And the class is giving you a virtual round of applause, even though we're all on mute. Uh, 